Salutations, monstrous members of the realm. I am your host, Lane McLeod Jackson, actor, director, playwright, and framed for a crime I didn't commit. But we're not here to talk about me. I've got some good news for you. Greatness lies before you. <laughs> Fame, fortune, everything you desire, I can help you achieve it. And all I require is such a small thing. <laughs> a trifle. After all, nobody's going to miss one small child. <laughs> Let's talk about hags. I love them. I love them so much. Now, as always, our first question is, where do we draw inspiration? And for the hags, there's an unlimited amount to gather from. First, almost every culture out there has its own version of the secretive, wicked, evil spirit that takes the form of an old woman hiding in the forest or the bog or maybe even under your bed. We can draw on the various witches and enchantresses from myth. These women have great power, and though they play the antagonists, still have very human motivations and goals. But on the other hand, who cares about human motivation? Because we can draw on goddesses who have been associated with witchcraft and also often take the form of withered old women, possibly from the gates of hell. So we've got witches, we've got enchantresses, we've got spirits, we've got goddesses, and we haven't even touched on any of the craptastic myths that started going around about women in general during the Inquisition. Burn the witch, often because she already represents an outcast within our community, or she's more powerful than we're comfortable with as a woman, and we want her money. Stop, breathe, hold it, put down the torch. Let's take this from the top. Before we go any further, let's talk about what a hag isn't. First, hags are not witches. Witches are people, and that's true historically, literarily, and, to their credit, in virtually every role-playing setting. Now, the history of witchcraft and hag folklore are linked, particularly in Europe. But for my purposes, whenever an angry mob with torches and an inquisitor shows up, I sentence Abigail forthright to burn for her crimes of witchcraft and heresy. That's the bad guy! Now that's not to say you can't steal from some of literature's greatest sorceresses. Both Le Fay and Medea used a garment that when placed over the victim, they would burn alive from the inside. And it is your constitutional right to use an item like that. Hags are also not goddesses. Ishtar, Hecate, Mother Earth, they all may take the form of withered old crones in order to give a prophecy or two, but they still have all the power of divinity. That being said, you can still draw on some of that potent mother goddess energy. For example, one of my favorites, the Bive, inspires a ton of later Celtic legends and knew how to make an entrance to a party. They saw a lone woman coming to the door of the hostel after sunset, seeking to be let in. As long as a weaver's beam wore each of her two shins, and they were as black as a stag beetle. She wore a grey hooded mantle over her head. Her hair reached down as far as her knees, and her lips were all on one side of her face. Spoiler, doesn't end well for the hostel. But the hags, as they are portrayed in the world's oldest slash greatest slash strangest role-playing game, and its various spiritual successors, draw on, and this is going to shock you, three primary influences. The first is Baba Yaga. Now, Baba Yaga is, in the words of the legendary Julian Presley, bad. This woman's got it all. Morning, noon, and night just ride after her, waiting to be told what to do. She's got flaming skulls that incinerate families, giant pigs that can fly through the night sky, and a mortar and pestle she can row through the woods. Do you have that? I didn't think you had that. And that's all just from one story. And designers know she's a major force. In Pathfinder, she's the star of a couple of great adventures, because she also happens to rule her own Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe-style nation. And does it end there? Oh, no, sorry, Bob. She appears all over the D&D universe, including the classic adventure, Baba Yaga's Dancing Hut. But in 5th edition, her influence can be most felt in the hag section of Volo's Guide to Monsters. 
We're talking from the fire skull to the vehicles to the strange secrets held in weird magic. So you should feel free to do the same. Draw from Baba Yaga's source material yourself. Those stories are just fun. The second major influence is the Weird Sisters. Now, in this section, I'd be remiss not to mention the Greek Grahai, who shared a single eye and tooth between them and helped Perseus discover their dreaded cousin, Medusa. They ratted out Medusa. Shame. Shame. And the Grai help inspire arguably the three most famous witches in Western literature, those prophetic madams of doom from the Scottish play. When shall we three meet again in fire, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun. Where the place upon the heath? There to meet with Macbeth. We don't say that word. A sense of ritual, a seemingly paradoxical method of speech, a menacing offer to help, and not to mention a very refined palate. I have newt and toe of frog, wool of bat, and tongue of dog. And it's from these wayward sisters you get some of the best flavor texts. The one Haggai that's split amongst the members of the coven, why that's straight out of the Grai sisters. Or the prophetic nature and aesthetic love of cauldrons, those are from my girls in the Scottish play. Third, and frankly most importantly, are the hags found in the folklore of the British Isles. And in this case, we can definitely see why D&D split them up into different sections. The green hags are inspired by a whole bunch of river fairy myths. We're talking Jenny Greenteeth. We're talking Peg Powler. We're talking the legendary Nellie Longarms. And those are just the English versions of this story. The Naki is a fine Finnish example, if ever there was one. But they all have one thing in common, which is they want you to come over, have a visit, so they can drown you. Sea hags can be found in Scotland and Ireland. Take, for example, the Storm Crones or any other spirit haunting the rocks. Night hags emerge from stories about people being hag-ridden, the same sleep paralysis that inspired the myths of the succubi and incubi. So you can see how our role-playing hags are made up of all of the above. You get a hint of Baba Yaga, a taste of the Weird Sisters, a whole lot of Nelly Longarms, and voila, together you get one delicious child-flavored pie. We also see about a dozen ways hags can be used in your campaigns. But these videos we're making, they're not about monstrous NPCs. These are about villains. So what core can we use to best bring out all of these features? Well, to destroy your hero and all they hold dear, let me present the Hidden Rot. Now, every hag out there, from Pathfinder's Bestiaries to Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manuals, want to pervert all the goodness they find in the world. Beauty becomes grotesque. Love goes on and withers into hatred. Justice becomes tyranny. And while hags can certainly affect the fate of nations, these creatures are made for a more pastoral environment. That's because the hag herself is a perversion of the archetypical wise woman. Keepers of wisdom who bring children into the world. The midwives, healers, the cunning folk who know the secrets behind the forest. In other words, real witches. But the hag is a hoarder of secrets. She sacrifices or eats little children. She is the danger that hides in these woods. So some short story hooks might include... A pair of green sisters and a night hag have banded together in a coven because one of your players has rage issues. They want to use their combined skills to make every social interaction they have a trial. Turn him against his fellow players. They're going to make him an oath breaker. Your paladin has no idea why he is facing such trouble. But he knows sweet blasphemies are being whispered in his ear. Or your players come across an unusual town, quiet, lovely, almost too peaceful. 
The party sees a group of children standing on the banks of a river. Something seems off. At first they think it's a mirage, but as they come closer, it becomes far too clear. All the children look the same. Dozens of little girls with dirty blonde hair, frozen smiles and wicked eyes. The town is enthralled to their will. A member of the party rolls knowledge arcana. Sighs begins to explain precisely what this vision means. Hags reproduce by consuming infants, normally done but once in a great while. This town is home to dozens of these little girls who will become murderous heathens. But what's your party to do? They are, after all, only children. And won't the parents of these innocents defend their own to the death? Those are some good short-term problems, but let's relish in our wickedness a little bit. Stretch our teeth out. Now, hags can metamorph from one variety to the other if they have the resources and means to do so. And this allows us something precious, a hint at the motivations behind an inscrutable mind. Let's meet Nana Ethel. Nana Ethel likes to travel. She goes from town to town like a traveling merchant, selling suffering and extracting a heavy price for her wares. But Nana Ethel is not content to merely gather strange and bizarre artifacts or hidden knowledge. She has lived long portions of her endless life as one variety of hag or the other. This road has not been easy. Even for a hag, she is hated, and those experiments are tearing her apart. You're tearing me apart, Ethel. But she's got a theory, you see, a philosophy behind her work. In order to truly debase something, its purest form must exist in contrast. It's only when you have hope that despair flourishes. For instance, when she takes on the form of a sea hag, she becomes Ethel Misty. Now, Ethel is tongueless, toothless, with jagged wooden spears through her hands and feet. But in her hideous visage, she has the most beautiful, pure blue eyes that have ever existed. But as an anatag, she becomes Ethel Pearlgrin, who is blind, tongueless, still with wooden chips driven through her palms and feet. But now, with the most childlike, innocent grin you've ever seen, framing a sweet face on a terrible ogre-like body. Then there's the verhag Ethel Wormwood, who is blind, toothless, and tongueless, but instead of wood in her hands, it becomes a mystical staff, and she possesses an ice queen's statuesque beauty and a face of monstrous nightmare. But finally, there is her original and most natural form, which is good old Ethel Sweet Tongue. Now this green hag is blind and toothless with wood sticking through her poor arthritic hands and feet, but she has a voice. She has a tongue that can summon the most beautiful melodies, songs that would make a harpy green with envy. But she has seen the sights and sounds of this world. It is time to twist virtue and compassion on a much grander scale. It is time for her to take the final form. She will become a night hag, but first she has some unfinished business. And it is here in the hamlet called Porous Hill, where her travels started many lifetimes ago. In the fog-covered moors and bogs she once called home, she will find the ingredients and power necessary to make this final metamorphosis. This will take time and will put her in a vulnerable position, but if she is strong and cunning, she will succeed. And before the final steps are taken, she will see this blasted town tear itself apart. But how? Who aids her? Where does our schemer live? Ah, these are all questions for our next video. But before I go, I'd like to leave you with a taste of what these fey women leave behind. This is a poem written about black Anis, a monstrous creature who apparently hunted in the Dane hills of England. It is said the soul of mortal man recoiled to view black Anis' eyes so fierce and wild. Vast talons, foul with flesh, there grew in place of hands. With features livid blue glowered on her visage, while at the obscene waist warm skins of human victims close embraced. Thank you for watching, and DMs, remember... 
always break legs and your players' hearts.